So I hope uh, this will feel relevant to you. Um, one of the things you see in the book of Proverbs is there's wise people, there's foolish people, there's wicked, there's things like that. The, uh, the fool is a really person you don't want to be. That's what the book of Proverbs is about. You don't want to be the fool. But there's an interesting verse where it says, do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than him. And that word, and you see that a lot in scripture, being wise in your own eyes. That word eyes can also mean like spring or fountain. Like you, you think you're your own source of truth, your own source of, of whatever. And so I hope as parents, one of the things that I don't want is a, a, a child who is wise in their own eyes or a child who is a Pharisee. I want them to be teachable. But there's, a, there's this, the tension is, but I want them to be moral. I want them to follow Jesus. So how do I learn how to do this? So we're going we're gonna to talk about that if we, if we can get to it, hopefully. But we're going to switch over to chapter 4 and read about what happens. You'd think the story's over. And most people, when they hear the story of Jonah, it's like, he said no, he, he, he ran away, got thrown over, swallowed by a fish, repented, preached, and then repented. Story's over. But there's this whole other chapter that's given for a reason that I want to talk about. Chapter 3 just ended with when they saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. And then you would maybe expect it to say this. And Jonah returned to his own land rejoicing. <laughs> right? That's not in the Bible. It doesn't say that. But understand this. You just realize, Jonah, you are the most successful prophet in history. This, this is like going to Las Vegas and the whole city turns. Like you, I mean, imagine any artist who's like, hey, we're going to display your artwork in New York. It was like, I'm so mad about that. Like, what? You know, you write this song and like, hey, so-and-so, this famous person is going to sing your song and they're mad about it. You're successful. Here Jonah is doing exactly what he was supposed to do and, and called to do and then he's mad about it. So what we want to talk about in this session is with our own children, this, is, this whole topic is really important because your children will become what they see you believe, not what you say you believe, right? There's this phrase, more is caught than taught. It's what they see in your life, what they're watching you do, and they're listening to how you pray and what you pray for and who you pray for. And this is where we're modeling for our kids um, what they're going to think this is what Christianity is all about. If they see it as this is kind of our hobby, we just do this, we get up on Sunday mornings and probably argue until we get to the parking lot and then we all say, everyone be quiet, we're at church. They're like, okay, I can do that. I can handle this. It's like faking, it's like acting. We can do that for a little while. I mean, Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights, right? I'm trying to help my kids pray differently because there's these little rote prayers that they pray. I'm just like, that is so pathetic, but they learned it from me. What is going on? Oh, a lizard on your... Thank you, sir. Uh, okay. Please. It was probably Chris who did it anyway, so sorry about that. Um... What I don't want my kids to think is that Christianity is something that is just something I've added on to my life. It's just our faith tradition. This is our hobby. This is just how I'm raising you. But that Jesus is our life. And I'm so guilty of not thinking that. And <clears throat> even my prayers, when I hear my kids pray, Lord, give us a good day. Thank you for everything you've given us. Please give us a good day. I'm like, that is so vague and generic. I know they learned it from me. Like, what does a good day mean anyways? Everything goes your way. Like, when does that ever happen, right? It was a good day. So helping my kids, um, it's, it's learning how to model this. So let's read about Jonah's attitude. Remember that word great? We talked about that great city, a great storm. Here's where the word great is going to show up again. Look in chapter 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. That's greatly, same word. And he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, remember Ahab pouting, listen to this, O Lord, 
Is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are, and then he quotes from Exodus 34 and other Psalms, a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Some translations say, do you have a right to be angry? Do you think you have a right to be angry? Jonah is so upset that the Ninevites have repented that he's angry enough to die. So, verse 5, Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself, a little hut, a little tent. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. I think he had hopes that maybe God still was going to destroy them. He went to a front row seat of the fireworks, hopefully. Maybe he was picturing like Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't know. Verse 6, now the Lord God appointed, there's that sovereign word we talked about before, a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad. There's that word great. He was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. You see what God is doing right here? He's, he's looking down at Jonah, and he's using all of this, even as a parable right now, Jonah, I want to teach you a lesson in what I'm giving you and what I'm taking from you. And just a reminder, you guys, that God sees you, and he's patient with us, and man, he is, I'm just so stubborn, so often and unteachable, and yet he personally wants to change my heart and show me more of who he is. So God's got this analogy, this illustration he's putting up in front of him. Um, the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint, and he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? Do you have a right to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And then here's the key point. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. Like that's what you care about. Jonah, that's what you're mad about? A plant, really? You care about that? And then here's the final question. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? Like you're all, you, you care about this stuff. And then for me, that convicts me about like, what are all the things that I buy and pursue and stress over and care about and God's like, yeah, that's actually not what I am passionate about. This is what he's trying to help Jonah understand. And here's what I love about this story, you guys. It ends. You don't know what Jonah's answer was. You're like, what? Tell me, what does he do? It's just like the story of the prodigal son, which should really be prodigal sons, because what that story shows is there's two ways to be separated from the father. Break all of his commands or keep all of his commands. Both sons, the father went out to them. The younger son, it was more obvious. But for the older son, the, the older brother, and this is where I want to talk about this Pharisee thing. He kept all the rules. He would have been the good son that we want. Like, I want a son who is always obedient. But his heart was off. And he was mad that the father threw this party for his younger brother. And the father says, listen, I, I love you. Everything that I have is yours. And, but then he says, but we had to celebrate, some translations say. We had to celebrate. For this, your brother was lost and he's found. He's dead and he's alive. And guess how that story ends? What are you going to do, older brother? How are you going to respond? It ends the same way. And so this is where it's a reminder for us of just, it's not a matter of, of law keeping, rule keeping. Of course it's important for us to obey, but it's from the heart. I posed this question to my kids earlier this year. Do you think, is, are there ever times Satan would want you to obey? Or Satan would be perfectly happy that you always do the right thing? Yeah. 
if it's because I think that now I'm earning my place with God, now that God owes me because of look of who I am. Look how, how much I can look down on my younger brothers. Of course God would want you to do that, right? So it's not just the outward stuff. It's the heart. That's what God is trying to get at with Jonah, who was mad that God did all this, um, had this attitude towards him. You know, another two stories that are back-to-back, we're talking about Pharisees, and I want you to discuss this amongst yourselves in just a second. John 3 and John 4. John 3 is the story of Nicodemus, the Pharisee, coming to Jesus, a very moral, upright, educated, religious man, pillar of society. And then John 4 was this Samaritan woman, so there's opposite gender, another nationality, another religion, immoral woman. She'd had five different husbands, was currently living with a guy who she wasn't married to. We added, you guys know this, we added in chapters and verses later, right? John chose what stories he was going to put in his book. At the end of the book of John, he says, there are so many stories I could have told you. These are in here so that you would believe. So what that means is John decided, I'm going to tell two stories back to back, and I'm going to put them right after each other. And it might be easy for me to go, these people are like the most opposite, have nothing in common if I'm looking at it on the surface. But I think John put it in there to say, no, they both have the same issue. They both need Jesus. And Jesus both patiently explains to them what their real need is. It's interesting, the the comparison. We already saw the story of the woman who's a sinful woman in the home of a Pharisee. Contrast right there. We saw the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. John makes this comparison right here. So the people that Jesus went after, we mentioned before, were these tax collectors and sinners. You know the story I mentioned already when Matthew gets saved? Here's what it says in, um, in Matthew's account. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners." Guess what word is used in Romans 5? I already mentioned this. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, and guess what? Same word that all the religious people were accusing. This is us. Do I see myself as a spiritual pauper, as a spiritual beggar, as if apart from Christ? Like that's the point. When Jesus was... The reason Jesus told the parable of the lost son, actually told three parables in a row, you get this insight ahead of time. This is, again, why I love the Bible tells us why he told a parable. Look what it says. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Remember what Jonah should have been doing? Returning to his own land rejoicing? These religious people should have been like, yes, sinners are coming to hear the truth. But what do they do? They grumble. I was convicted of this at my church that I used to work at when we were in Georgia. When outside, we had a smoking section. And I I was like, why do we have that? Isn't that kind of encouraging? And and instead of thinking like, people are coming to church. People are here to hear the truth. Like, I want them to hear this. These are the very people that we're we're trying to. I'm not saying that Again, I'm not categorizing sins. I'm just saying my attitude was so like, oh, they're sinners, they're worse people, rather than that's not their real problem. Nicotine is not their real problem. It's Jesus. That's what they need. Let's just get them all here. Let's go out and tell them that's what they need. What I love is Jesus then tells a story of a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. And every, three, every parable ends with a party. Every parable ends with a celebration. That's the heart of God. Yes, we're throwing a party. It's also where you get that word compassion that we talked about the other day, that his father had compassion on him and threw his arms around him and wouldn't even let his son finish his little rehearsed speech and kissed him and said, bring the best robe from the house. You, you know who's, whose robe in the house was the best robe? The dad's is the best robe. Everything he's restored. The son's attitude was, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. The older brother's attitude was, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command. 
Now, I look at that and I just go, I, I would love it if, if my, my children didn't go the way of the younger brother and didn't go the way of the older brother, but it could happen. I mean, it's happened in our home. It's just one of those, like, I, I just want to make sure that they understand the gospel. And the gospel is, again, we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared imagine, yet we are more loved and accepted in Christ than we ever dared hope. In other words, I'm so bad that I have no reason to boast if I do good, because I'm like, that's just by God's grace. But it's also no reason for me to, if I sin, to wallow and to think God's totally going to get rid of me. It's just wonderful news. That that's My righteousness is in Christ alone. So here's what I want you to do. In groups of two to, uh, no, more than two, like four or a few more people, discuss this together. Not just, not just you and your spouse. Discuss this together. How can we avoid raising little Pharisees while at the same time wanting obedient Christ followers? Because of course we want that. And then you can maybe talk about this along the way. What's at the heart of a Pharisee? What's, what's really the root problem going on there? So uh, real quick, I'm going to give you five minutes and we will solve this problem and all of us will never have to worry about this ever again. Okay, five minutes go. Turn to those around you. Talk about what's going on here. Okay, head back to your seats, please, or turn around. And we're turning, and we're back. Here we go. All right, let's take some answers. Uh, what are some ways to avoid raising little Pharisees? What did you, how did you solve this problem? What do you guys think? What? What'd you say? Donate to the, donate your children away to the church. Okay. Got it. Okay. Yes. So acknowledging your own sin humbly and modeling prayer humbly in front of them. Okay. Good. One of Katie's, her dad who didn't become a believer until he was 40 almost, I always just use the phrase, not perfect, but real. Like, I just want to be real. I'm real. I know I'm not perfect. And that, it was so refreshing when I met him, when I, he was admitting in front of me, like, oh, I was so in the flesh today. This man made me, and I was like, this is all strange to me, hearing this person just be open about that. So great, okay? Other ideas? Okay. 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 Got it. Okay. Yeah. Discussing is a scary topic on our part of our list of choices. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Harder. Yeah. Okay. I think a lot of times you realize it's not a choice between being Jesus or Judas. It's between Jesus and an upright, really moral person. That's part of the problem. That's not the goal. We want to be like Jesus, but it's not just so I can look this way. And that's, again, where we said Satan would want them to be obedient. Even in how we tell stories, I think of uh, if you were to ask your kids, why did God spare Noah? Because you read it, I mean, did Noah not have a sin nature? Did Noah not? It says that all the earth was corrupt and every intention. We forget that before all this stuff happens, it says, and Noah found grace in the eyes of God, favor. It's God's grace first that Noah had. That's the only way. Because a lot of times we think the story about the flood is just a warning, like be better, be like Noah, and then you'll avoid them. The miracle of the ark, the miracle of the story, by the way, is not that there was um, a flood, it's that there was an ark. That's the amazing thing, like, man, that God was merciful and God was gracious, even to someone who we know he had a, he had a sin nature. I mean, his kids had, we saw his, we see his sin nature come out after the flood. So it's not that Noah was perfect. I was reading a story, a famous story. Let me tell you a real quick quote before I move on. Warren Wearsby, I was reading a commentary by him, and he said, the flesh loves religious legalism 
because rules and regula- regulations enable a person to appear holy without really having to change his heart. This is why my flesh loves rules and rule following because I can appear righteous. I can appear holy in front of everybody, but my heart never has to change. And that's what the Pharisees did. On the outside, they looked great. But Jesus said, inwardly, you're, you're like full of dead man's bones. Like you're just, it's terrible. You're vipers, son of the devil. Like he's called them a lot of bad things that you would never want to be called. But that's kind of the issue. I was reading um, the, the little red hen to my kids, <laughs> which is a great story if you want to teach about the importance of hard work. It is a terrible story if you want to teach them how to be a legalistic rule follower because you think of the end of this, you guys know the story, right? No one helps the little red hen. And at the end, she makes the bread and who will help me eat it? And they're like me. She goes, nope. And she's like, I'm going to eat this all by myself. <laughs> so work hard, kids. And you go, okay, that's all right. You should work hard. That's not the heart of God. That's not what we saw in the parable of the vineyard. We don't do anything. God just goes, freely, I adopt you. Come to my banquet. What? A better book is the one that we used last year for crew called Sydney and Norman. If you guys don't have this book, it is so great. It's actually by Phil Vischer, <coughs> Veggie Tales. It's about these two little pigs, and it's basically the Pharisee and the tax collector. Such a great little book because it's one, one little pig who just thinks he's great, and he really is great. He keeps all the, the rules, and there's other one who's just messed up and clumsy, and, and he just can't. It's a, it's a great, great story. So let's do a real quick three-point application. We've got to fly through this because we got four minutes. <laughs> Number one, aren't you glad that God loves his enemies? Remember this verse we just read in Romans 5? While we were his enemies, while I was your foe, I'm so glad. And so if I begin to see other people as the enemy, I think I'm missing the heart of God because God's like, yeah, that was you. You understand. I came for you. I came for my enemies. So am I okay with God loving my enemies or do I begrudge God's mercy? Am I okay with the wideness of God's mercy? This is where God was trying to say, Jonah, you're so upset about this, but look at these people. Shouldn't I pity these people? Second application is a reminder. You can know the word of God and still not know the God of the word. I think of that with our kids. I don't just want, when, when, with my first, probably three children, Ron's my third, I was so big, I was, a high school, I was a high school Bible teacher at the time, I was so big on, I want them to know all these Bible stories, and in my heart, I'm just going to confess here, in my pride, I wanted at the end of church, like the Sunday school teacher to say like, man, they know all of these stories, I, that's what I wanted. That, it's not just knowing all the stories. Knowledge is great, Right? My heart can't love what my mind doesn't know, right? So I need to read the word. I want to grow in knowledge, but knowledge can puff up easily. So it's not just this. Charles Spurgeon said, to wash and dress a corpse is a far different thing from making it alive. Man can do the one. God alone can do the other. It's not just looking great. It's what's going on on the inside. Again, God didn't come to make bad people good, but dead people alive. That's what God's coming to do. So I don't want to be hollow. Another great guy to quote a lot is A.W. Tozer. He said, you can be as straight as a gun barrel theologically and empty as one spiritually. You can get all, you've got all your ducks in the row. You know all the right answers. You have got it, but still be empty. So many times, um, I think Jesus did the facepalm with religious people. <laughs> like, guys. I love you, but oh, you're just missing it. Upset that he's healing this guy on the Sabbath. How about he's healed? <laughs> Upset that this woman who's been bent over all these years gets healed. You did that on the wrong day. Like, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. How hard does your heart have to be? Next reminder. God wants your dependence, not your performance. I don't know if you guys know about uh, Team Hoyt, this father-son team that the son has cerebral palsy, and uh, they run triathlons together, or they do triathlons together. And what's so, it's amazing to watch because the, 
The father puts his son in a raft, and he's got this strap, and he swims the part, and then he comes back, puts him on a bike, and he bikes that, that leg. Then he puts him in this big jog stroller, and then he jogs that last part, and then they cross the finish line, and they both get a medal. They both get a medal. And when people say, hey, Christianity's a crutch, I go, uh, it's a stretcher. <laughs> He's got to carry me. And yet, in the, you see God saying, I'm going to reward you. And I'm like, what in the world? You did all of this. And that's why I think in the book of Re- Revelation, you see all these, these the elders casting their crowns down before him because they know it's you. What's our verse? Not to us, O Lord, but to you give the glory. You're the one who did this all. So with my kids, I, want their, I don't want their performance. God doesn't want my performance. It's dependence on him. I don't just want a morally restrained heart, but a, but a transformed heart. That's what I want. Katie's prayer for our kids is from Jeremiah 24-7, which is a great, because you can remember 24-7, but it's where God says, I will give them a heart to know me. And that's what we got to pray. Lord, please, I will try to model this imperfectly. I will take them to church. We will talk about spiritual things. But you, you give them a heart. That's my only hope. Being raised in the church is not foolproof. Right? The only person that can live the Christian life is not you. It's Jesus. So Paul says, listen, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. It's Christ who lives in me. But it's, it's great. If that's my goal, if dependence is my goal, then weakness is an advantage. That's why Paul could say, so I want to boast about my weaknesses because then his strength shines through. Last one, don't mistake your performance for your position in Christ. I don't know how many of you ladies have seen this, but the movie Batman Begins with Christian Bale, right? At the end of the movie, there's this line that when I first heard the movie, I thought was so cool. And he's kind of telling Rachel who he really is. And he says, it's not who I'm at, who I am underneath, but what I do that defines me. That sound pretty good? So-so? Rachel. Okay. When I first heard that line, I was like, oh, that's cool. It's not who I am underneath, but what I do that defines me. And then I was like, wait a minute, that's terrible. What I do defines me? If that's, what, if that's what the Christian life is about, I am a roller coaster, you guys. If my standing before God is all based on my score for the day, I am all over the board. Some days it's great, some days it's like, mm, nope, not good at all. It's interesting that as Paul got o- older, there's these three autobiographical statements he made about himself as he got older. Earlier to the Corinthians, he said, I'm the least of the apostles. Sounds humble, but I'm an apostle. Later, he said, I'm the least of the saints. Even later, you guys know what he said? I'm the chief of sinners. I don't think he was trying to pretend to be humble. I think he really, the more he saw himself and the more God shined his light on his heart, the more he saw how big and glorious God is and how big that chasm really was between him and God and how much bigger his Jesus had to become, right? You guys know the old illustration, God on one side, man on the other, chasm in between, the cross. The more I realized that, the more I just realized how big my Jesus is and what he had to do to overcome that. So I think Paul really was saying like, yeah, I'm the chief of sinners. But for you and I, I've got to remember that, that it's, it's not who I am underneath. It's not, I mean, it is who I am underneath. What Jesus says about me, it's my heart. It's not what I do that defines me. And what that means for me is my kids are not my report card. My job is not my identity. My status is my looks are not my security, like all of these things. And I need to help my kids see that. Just little things you can remind your kids. Hey, you know, you're not your score. At the end of this game, that's not you. That, that, that ultimately is not why I love you or anything like that. It's, it's going to be okay. When I was a camp director, I mean, literally, I would have to tell myself this every week because we get all these evaluations from grumpy campers. I mean, um, from, uh, I'm just kidding. 
We get all these evaluations of people saying, here's what I think of your job. Here's, what, how, here's how I think you did. And I'm like, at the end of every week, and I'm a words of encouragement, love language guy, so I'm like, okay, here it goes. This is not my identity. <laughs> because I'm about to read this. What do they think of me? And when you really get that free, you guys, that it's not my score. You guys know when I think of scorekeeping, you know when you watch ice skating at the end, they're waiting to see the score. Sometimes it's really great news. Sometimes it's really bad news. <laughs> I love the look on her face. But here's what the gospel does. It is freedom from scorekeeping. I'm, there is not some big scoreboard over my head every day that God's going like, let me see your score today. I'm not on trial. I am not in the courtroom where I'm waiting like, tell me the verdict today, God. What do you think of me today? He's like, what are you doing in the courtroom? Court adjourned, case dismissed. My son went to trial for you. Do you get that? He relates to us now as a father, not as a judge. So again, he's going to deal with my sin. He's going to work on it, but I'm not condemned every day because of this. There was a guy when my son's basketball team made it to the state playoffs, and Caleb had a lousy game the whole first half. He didn't make us. I mean, he was a junior, and he was one of our probably second best scorers. And at halftime, I was trying to encourage him over to the locker room, and this dad, I had to walk by the opponent to get back to my spot, stopped me, and he goes, is that your son? I was like, yeah. And he goes, man, he's a great ball player. I was like, oh, thanks. We'll see. You know, this is the state playoffs. This is a lot at stake here, right? And... Um, we had played their team before, and he, he kind of knew my son. Comes down to 10 seconds left. They score. And I'm honestly like, I don't think we're going to be able to make it in 10 seconds. So we pass the ball in to our star player. It gets kind of bounced us off somebody's foot, and the ball shoots down the court to Caleb. And with three seconds left, he makes a basket to send the game into overtime. Let's pray. I'm just kidding. No. So I'm not going to end with that story. Here's, here's what happened. Everyone's excited, every, every, and all the people on our side, are, and we were all on the same side, both teams, because of the, of the seating in the gym. And people turn and give Katie and I high fives as if we had anything to do with it, right? And we're like, hey, thanks. And then I look over, and there's this hand, and it's that guy. And he's like, that was awesome, and he's giving me five. And I was really like, hey, like, what are you doing over here? And I realized he is so free. To be able to go over to the other team and to tell somebody else, great job. He was so free in his heart. Like, this isn't my identity. Whether or not my kid wins or loses, this is not, this has no eternal value. And I was like, man, I'm so convicted because I guarantee if his son made that shot, I would not be over there giving him high five. I just know my heart. I mean, I, I know it. But this is what the gospel does. I get, to, I'm free to love people just to love people. Not to try to earn or pay back or prove. I'm just going to love you. I will tell you about Jesus. And God's going to take care of the rest. But I'm not, I'm just free to do this. That's what the gospel ends up doing. On the back of your notes, sir, I've just got a reminder from Matthew 6 where Jesus talks about, please don't do things to be seen by men. I'll end with this. I really am ending body. Here's what Paul says in Philippians 3. Paul says, Hey, you want to play the scorekeeping game? Guess what? I can beat you every time. Listen to what he says. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. You cannot hold a candle to me. If you want to talk about the performance game, scorekeeping, I win every time. I'll win the Bible drill every time. Like, you just pick it, I'm going to beat you. If that's all that mattered, then he wins. But Paul knew that's not the way it works. So he goes on and he says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Literally, dung is the word that he uses there. All that stuff that was on the scoreboard that I could have bragged about, dung, manure, that's what it is. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. And here is the good news that we need to make sure we remember and our kids know and we're sharing with people. Not having a righteousness of my own 
that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. It's his righteousness that affects my standing before God. Imagine my adopted daughter saying to me, hey, dad, I cleaned my room today. Am I still your daughter? I'd be like, baby, you don't, yeah, yeah, that, that has nothing, that has nothing to do with whether or not you're my daughter. You're missing it. Your standing with me is not based on your performance. Now, because I love you, we'll talk about stuff and I'll address stuff, but it's because it's you're my daughter. You're not going to lose, lose me, your spot in the family because your performance is, that's not what God wants from us. It's our dependence on him every day. So, I love that Paul goes on and he says, it's not that I've achieved all this perfectly. I'm not there yet. But one thing I do, I forget what's behind. I strain forward to take hold of him who first took hold of me. I am, I am pursuing with white hot passion the one who first pursued me. That's my goal. That's what I'm doing. And so therefore, you guys, with our children, if more is caught than taught, then do they see mom and dad pursuing with white hot passion Jesus? Not church stuff. Not just being good, not being moral. It's Jesus. Do they understand that? Because that's what we want for them, right? But am I modeling that for them? Am I showing them? Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Let me pray for us. Lord, thanks so much for our time and studying the story of Jonah. Thank you that you are a patient God, that you're a merciful God and yet a holy God, that we can learn so many things about your character in this one story, that you take sin seriously and yet you have mercy and compassion and you you love people corporately like Nineveh and you love people individually like Jonah. And you're so patient and we pray that you would continue to unite our heart with your heart. Help us to, to know the heart of God and to want to model that for our children that you bless us with, Lord, and, and to be honest with them about our challenges and our failures and, um, Lord, that our prayer for them would not just be rule followers and obedient children, but kids whose hearts have been changed and uh, who are wanting to know you the way Paul said there. God, we love you. We're grateful for um, just the amazing gift of salvation we get to enjoy and share. That's in your name we pray. Amen.